Hey guys, welcome to TGS with me, Johnny. Today, we're going to look at Japanese gun makers, both past and present, up until a point. Sort of post-World War II gun makers of Japan. There have been quite a few, and I will probably miss some. However, the real difficulty here is that there is very limited documentation and evidence of any of what I'm about to say. So some of it is circumstantial, some of it is wrapped together, and there is no complete history of it out there. But we're going to try and do it justice, starting with the Kodensha plant. So the Kodensha plant was making guns for a few years, but many of us will know them more for the Olin-Winchester connection of Olin Codentia. In 1962, Winchester got into bed with the Codentia plant and funded them to build another building. Post-1962, there was two Codentia plants in Tachigi City. One very large one that housed the Winchester, Olin Winchester operation, and a smaller one to the side, which was the original Codentia plant. The smaller of the two was dedicated more to the Nikko guns as many others, although the two seemingly swapped parts and workforce without any real issue. Eventually, by the end of this, the arrangement between Nikko, Codentia, and Winchester fell apart. And this was for a number of reasons. Firstly, it is said, and everyone kind of agree on this point, that Nikko was taking all of the good wood. So when the shipments of wood came in, Nikko would take all the good stuff and give all the bad stuff to Winchester. I would say the bad stuff, the less interesting stuff. Part and parcel of this is the deal that went down between Codentia and Olin was that they could only have two employees in the plant of 400 Codentia workers. That's kind of difficult. The second and rather large part of why the Codentia Olin thing sort of fell apart is that the deal between Olin and Codentia said you cannot export guns. And throughout time, Codentia actually, well, for the first few years, went down really well. Because obviously, this huge investment from Olin meant that they could have new technology, new, new money, and really boost their business. So it went down really well. But after a while, obviously, they got what they wanted, so they started to slightly break these rules. There's a huge amount of backdoor deals that went out of the back door of the Codentia plant that I can't guarantee but are quite obvious. Guns that were made inside of the period that they weren't supposed to export that are clearly a Nikko based gun with other names on. So yeah, they broke the rules. And then finally, uh, in the early 80s, they actually just exported Nikkos to the rest of the world, or to America, more importantly, which is the main part of the deal. And that's why that fell apart. And by 1987, they actually sold the plant to Classic Doubles, which was the well, was the management and workforce of the Codentia plant, and that only lasted a couple of years. And then subsequently, I think in 1988, the factory closed down. And then shortly after, boom, it was knocked down to the floor. So that was the short history of the Codentia plant. Now let's look at the guns that were made inside it. Before I do that, I'll make a little adjustment, and that is to say that Nikko actually exported guns well before I said, under various guises, and Winchester did know about it, However, they were too far in bed with them to get out of the deal, so that I think they kind of lived with it and just tried to sort of put stops where they could. But anyway, it all ended up falling apart. So we're going to start with Nikko. Nikko Firearms Company is the name that Codentia Firearms Limited used for their own guns. The name Nikko is actually the name of the prefecture where the Codentia plant is based, and interestingly, means sunshine. And I do think Nikos are a little ray of sunshine and probably one of the most undervalued guns out there. One of the many undervalued guns we're going to talk about, seeing as most Japanese guns that were made post-war, you really have to look hard to find a bad gun made in Japan. The engineering quality is up there and the price is down there. And their general shootability handling is, is pretty top-notch too. Anyway. I'm not going to wax lyrical too much because you'll know I'm a big Japanese guns fan. As with many of these things, not very much is known about the origins of Nikko, other than they started making shotguns in roughly 1955 and the first guns arrived in the American market in about 1960, and that was called the Nikko Grade 5. As time went on, they have made many dozens of models, many of which are undocumented, and you can see lots of little one or twos offs because, as I said earlier, the credential plant sent out loads of guns under different names. So it's quite often you'll pick up a gun that's clearly a Nikko that has a different name on it or that has a Nikko brand on it that will have a different model number. Anyway, some of the most common numbers, in fact, the most common model is the 5000. They made a, it's an over and under sporting shotgun of which they made a field, trap and a skeet. On top of the 5000, they made a 5100, a 6500, a 2200, and more importantly than all of these put together, they made the Shadow Indy and the Shadow Range. 
the Shadow Indy is begun with the obscenely wide rib. So Browning came out with the broad rib rib and this was hugely fashionable and, as with most things, more is always better. So Nico took that and they made a rib that was about this wide. A little triple layered thing made of alloy. Part of the issue with that is that the alloy is so conductive that if you've ever shot one in any serious level, it soaks up all the heat from the barrels into the triple rib and you end up with heat hazing, which isn't too bad if you're going to go shoot a round of sporting because you get all those breaks. But if you go and shoot a uh, 100 skeet, skeet straight, you will soon notice that when you're looking down this beautiful flat plane, well, it's pretty cool, but it is not particularly practical. Other models include the 612, the 812, and the Golden Eagle. They also made a side-by-side -side called the 201, and there's quite a few different variants of that that I can find out there. But again, nothing particular to string them all together. They also made a semi-automatic range. The semi-auto is called the Shadow as well, as well as there is one called the F1. Uh, there is some shadows that are not indies, that very much just look like 5000s. The problem again being is that Nikko put their guns all over the world so you can find one model with four different names because it was exported to four different parts of the world or even more than that. It gets a little bit confusing as with all of the Japanese guns because there's no particular documentation in English at least that it's easy to find. So Nikko being the main one that was made in the Kodensha plant there was lots of other guns made there not least the 101 Winchester, which is the biggie. But before I go on to that, let's just name a few of them. You have the classic doubles, not to be mistaken for the classic doubles that were later made by Meraki. You have the Parker Hale, not to be confused with the later Parker Hales that were made by uh, Rizzini. You have the Weatherby Olympium. You have the Ted Williams guns and loads of others. Loads of others. But anyway, now we're going to go on to the Winchester 101, which is really what the Olin Codentia plant was famous for because who cares about Nico? So the Winchester 101, as I said, started in 1962 when Olin Codentia became a thing. Olin and Codentia joined forces. And it's pretty much, but not entirely, a Nico 5000. It's a re-engineered Nico 5000, both of which are kind of pinched superposed designs or superposed inspired designs. Many people will say that they have interchangeable parts and they do at least have interchangeable firing pins and some other little bits, but most Mostly they're similar, not the same. The barrel lockup, the ejection system is all slightly different. So easy to say the Winchester is a Nico inspired gun, but the Nico is a superposed inspired gun. Anyway, let's go, let's move on. So the first Winchester 101s actually hit the shelves in 1963 and were available in a 12 bore only to start. As time went on, they made smaller calibers as well. They have a real cult following actually, as this beautiful simple, very reasonably priced, very well balanced, hand built-ish gun. And you can see why, they are amazing old guns. Uh, but I suppose, sadly enough, there's lots of people out there who probably won't agree with me and probably just think they're old trash. Because they kind of are a little bit, maybe, but they're clearly not. I can't believe I just said that, they're clearly not. Anyway, the originals came in a pigeon grade, a target grade, and diamond grade, although there are thousands of models again, given that they went to two different, two different mass markets, the European and American market, and they had actually got different names in those, although the same guns with different names went to both continents, so you can get, let's say a 6500 would be more common in Europe, but they are available in America, whereas a standard pigeon grade would be more common in America and less common in Europe. Strange, isn't it? But later 101 variants, the original 101s just were called the graded versions, but the later 101 variants had numbers, uh, them being 5500, which had some scroll work, a 6500, which was one of the first sporting guns ever, uh, that has a plain action, a 8500, which is one of my favourite guns of all time, and although it's not really related to this, the Grand European, and everyone could admit that a Grand European is one of the most beautiful Winchesters, again, it's one of the most beautiful guns ever made, really, and an absolute bargain for what they are. And I know I'm going to say this about a thousand times during this video, but it's because I mean it. Some would say these are the best Winchesters that were ever made, although those same people were probably sat there in a pub drinking uh, a bitter and licking the foam out of the moustaches. But I suppose if I had a moustache, I'd be one of them because I think they are some of the best Winchesters ever made, in fact, some of the best shotguns ever made. So that was the great 101 Winchester made in the Codentia plant. Absolutely fantastic guns. Loads and loads of guns were made there and loads of guns that you'll see with other names were probably made there, but we can't prove it. In fact, there's, there's some quite interesting rumours to do with mob connections in there as well, which is pretty cool. Uh, but you can't actually, you know, corroborate any of that. But it is interesting at least to know that there was some backdoor dealings there quite clearly 
And so there's lots of other guns out there that are quite clearly Codentia based guns or Nico based guns or Winchester based guns that say nothing to do with Codentia or Winchester on them. Fascinating, but let's move on. The 101 no longer exists, stopped in 1986, and is no longer made in Japan. It's made in Belgium, with a brief period where it was made in Portugal uh, with amalgamated bits from around the world. Interesting guns, but they're better now. They're better now by, by, by 101 Winchester. I'm not a great fan of selects but they're not a Japanese gun, so we're not talking about them today. Time for a quick intermission for me to say if you're enjoying this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and if you want to support the channel for some more great videos and content like this and non-lockdown content, don't forget to but join as a member. There's a button just there that says join, or in the description below, there's a little link that will take you there if you're on a mobile. So next up is the Kawaguchi Firearms Company, which is generally shortened to KFC, which was a gun making company based in Tokyo. They made a fairly uncommon over and under superposed and really date back quite far. Interestingly, KFC, and before I move on, has huge links to Maruku. So this is the most tenable story I could make up at least and kind of piece together from bits. Maruku was founded in 1893. They only really got into sporting shotguns in the late 50s, early 60s. And well, Kawaguchi Firearms Company was probably outsourced to make guns for them. And so you'll find guns marked Maruku and KFC together. And you'll also find KFC and Maruku guns both branded Mylark. Again, I can't corroborate any of this, but it seems logical that Maruku went to KFC and said, I want you to make guns and we'll stick your name on it. It wouldn't be the first big company to get somebody else to make guns for them and stick their name on it. It's been done by many thousands of people over the years. Anyway, my theory then goes that Maruku liked the idea, built their Kochi plant, produced their own guns, and KFC got in the bin. It is possible, though, and it is likely, because KFC was still imported to America up until the late 80s, that either somebody purchased that name to carry on, or they carried on in a minimal capacity up until that point. But again, I can't prove any of this, so... KFC also made cybersides. Some are potentially marked Hikibi, but they made three grades of cybersides copying various European makers, although some of their later stuff looks exactly like a Maruku. Again, this is the best information that I can corroborate because there's no actual central source for this. And it's at this point that I should say, I would love to write a Japanese guns history book and actually get all of the stuff in order because there's no particular science or logic behind Maruku, which we'll get into in a minute, or any of these makers' histories, past or models, and to actually do a definitive guide of that would be amazing. Maybe we should crowdfund that. That'd be a good idea. Anyway, before we move off, they also made something called a Model F, which is a very nice gun, and that is the very solid Maruku lookalike copy, but it is not known whether they made it from Maruku or vice versa. So, yeah, there you go. If anyone actually knows the answer to that properly, let me know below. So that leads us nicely on to Maruku. Another company with a fairly undocumented past. Interesting, there's no factory records, and there seems to be very little logic about models across the course of time. What is known is that in 1951, they got permission to develop their first hunting guns, and they did, both rifles and shotguns, over the course of time. And then in 1963, roughly the same time as Olin Winchester was getting into bed with the Codentia plant, Nico, they actually started getting into bed with Browning. And again, that boost of money into their business meant bigger, better guns. And that, that went well for them as well. You know, they were producing a very nice Satori designed gun based off of V Springs. They actually moved to Coil Springs in about 1955. Um, and as of 1955, it's a much more Browning based gun. That's when the sort of 3800s came out. Before that, we were talking, looking at the 800s and 600s and the, the really early models, the RREs, the HSWs, SWs, that kind of thing. However, we'll move into that in a second. No, let's get into it now. So there's a very simple way of grading early guns and that goes like this, S. S stands for a thin rib, machine turned thin rib. W stands for a wider rib. SW stands for a higher grade gun, generally with the high, wider rib. And HSW stands for the highest grade gun. So an SW is like a grade three and a HSW is like a grade five. There is various themes across these, so it's not quite as simple as that. Where again, there was custom options across the range and each country probably importer would have picked slightly different things. 
and interesting to see that you can see two HSWs between each other with only, let's say, a couple of years between them. And they can be very different guns. And here is where the confusion lies, is that there is no logical serial number registering, and the records from importers and exporters and from the factories seem fairly non-existent from what I can find. Where it gets truly confusing is that that 800 nomenclature actually lasted all the way through and so an 800 diamond grade and a 3700 diamond grade and 800 diamond grade are all kind of basically the same thing for a couple of years. It's, it's a confusion. And herein lies further confusion is that they used multiple different names for different models and every year or two seem to change the models and the names but keep the designs the same and just change the name on the design. And then they did not stamp the model or name on the gun up until the early 80s, pretty much. Throughout the late 70s, it's easier to date your gun at least, because it will have a brown, I think 75 to 78 is when they started changing up to a browning serial number system, so you can date your gun through the serial number. Before that, it's basically impossible unless you live in a country that dates their guns when proofed, which is lucky at least to be living in England where we do that. There are some hallmarks for grey, but it'd be quite difficult to tell because sometimes a HSW and an S double will vary only by a grip cap. You'll never find early grade Marukas with pretty wood. They, they were built as still working guns, so you'll rarely find an earlier Maruku with nice quality wood. When I say nice quality wood, most of the grading was done in engraving and accessories over wood quality. Whereas nowadays, it's pretty much done on wood quality and engraving, but you can look at a gun from five yards and tell what grade it is via wood. And that seems to be what we value nowadays, vice versa to back then when Maruku were producing their guns, when it was the hand finishing, hand engraving, and the little adornments on your gun that counted. And it was the wood that was secondary because the wood was chosen for standard and durability over beauty, interestingly. From the early 800s up until a point, it's very difficult to actually tell what gun you got. Mostly, like I said, because they add different names and numbers to a gun. But after the branding serial numbers and then the early 80s, they actually started putting their names on the guns. So we're going to talk through certain models and show you certain examples, but this is as good as we're gonna get. So the 3000s one we'll start with, an interesting gun that is not a Browning's purist's gun because, you know, it's not a true Browning, but I find it a fascinating gun, I absolutely love it. And then we move into the 3700s. You have the 3700S, the 3700R, the 3650. All guns were also available in up to about five or six grades, and as, like I said, infinitely customizable options. And I've said that a few times because it is important to note that you can get two identical models, but one will be black chrome finish and one will be silver penny finish, uh, or bright finish, and it's they can be the same, potentially. Uh, also, it's been so long and so many bits have been chopped and changed between guns occasionally it's hard to tell if something's truly original or not and whether it was either an original factory thing like that or whether it was just the fact that somebody's made a Franklin gun. Anyway, moving into the 3800s, and as I've said, you can get three guns that look identical. The only thing you can tell with Maruka is there is four different action types, type 1, type 2, type 3 and type 4 from the start all the way to the end using different actions. The th end one, uh, Type 4, is essentially what we would know as a modern day Maruku. And yeah, they've changed a little bit, the, the sear geometry's changed, um, but that Type 4 came in in the very early 80s with the 3800, but that was the same name and nomenclature as the previous gun that looked completely different. Confused yet? Because I am. Those, that 3800 nomenclature goes all the way through to a Type 4 action, so you get 3800s and a Type 2, Type 3 and Type 4. You'll get Type 3s in uh, Trap and Skeet, Settings, there is no sporters in a 3800 Type 3. The 3800 Sporter didn't really exist until recently. Th sporters didn't really exist um, at this point in the Maruka range at all. Getting out of the minefield and moving into prettier things, they also made a high grade gun called a President, and that is done in G grade. So you get a G11, G12, and G13, for example, all absolutely beautiful guns. They also made side plates, and you'll find those in a Type 3 and Type 4 action, I believe although the Type 4 action is slightly more common, and they are absolutely beautiful. Not a standard import thing though, so most of the ones you'll find in this country have either come from America or Australia or direct custom from the factory. You'll also find custom Marukus out there, 
and like I said, it gets quite confusing. Moving on, the Type 4 actions have the 6000, the 7000 and the 3800, moving into the 60, 70 and 38. There's also a 600 and 700 as well. And then there's the Maruku 4800 trap. I mean, what's that about? It's just another number chucked in. And I'm sure there are various other one of these through history that just aren't documented, that they made limited runs for, perhaps for countries that we don't even know exist. Who knows? And then there's concept guns. You might see one-offs. Maruku is really most famous for their browning guns. And I'm going to call browning a Japanese gun because 50% of them are built there. Starting in 1963 building rifles, by 1967 they were building the BT-99 for Browning, and then by 1970 building the Satori for Browning, by 1975 building the A5 for Browning, and then, you know, even to a point of in, in the early 80s building the 125 and having it finished by Browning Belgium. They are synonymous in every way. And then since then they've pretty much built every Browning shotgun that isn't a custom Belgian Browning. I mean, they even build rifles for Browning, or have built rifles for Browning. Nowadays, it's the AB3 and the Xbox they built. Browning definitely counts as a Japanese gun maker, at least 50% mention. Of probably more than 50% mention. They're a bloody Japanese gun for the most part, or at least the ones that the regular people out here will have. Apart from those who are called the, the Purist Brigade, who I would agree that a proper Browning is a Belgian Browning, but at the same time, I refuse to accept that a Browning GTI is not a proper Browning. That's built by Maruku. I refuse to accept that a 75 Pro Sport is not a proper Browning. And it's built by Maruku. There you go. That's all I'm going to say. And we'll move off of Browning. So Maruku Browning being one of the only two gun making companies that still exists making civilian arms. The other one is Hauer, which we all know and love for the 1500. Hauer's gun making career dates back to 1932 when they were making... The famous Arasaka Type 99, as well as parts for other Arasaka models and military arms and armaments and all sorts of other stuff. They still make military arms, that being the Type 89 automatic rifle and the Type 96 automatic grenade launcher. That's pretty cool. Uh, but we, as we said, know them for the 1500, which was produced in 1979 based off of the Golden Bear of 1967. The Golden Bear they made 3,000 of and exported them to America. A absolutely fascinating rifle, kind of loosely based around a couple of European rifles, and it went down really well. It was a very high quality rifle built to superb standards and went down, as I said, hugely well, which may led them to make the 1500, which is kind of a scaled down, dressed down, Americanized version, so you see a bit more inspiration from something like a Remy 700 go into the 1500, and it is still around today. And it's brilliant. It's changed a bit, you know, it has changed a little bit. They produced a mini action version. They've now got a better trigger in there. They use slightly different steel for the barrels than they did in the early models. But the most important thing about this, and it seems to be the case for all Japanese makers, is that they have made guns for other people who stick their name on. Weatherby, Mossberg, Webley, loads of people. Great rifles. And yeah, it's an interesting thing that it seems to be the case for every single Japanese maker is that somebody goes to them to make their guns for them. And they're still around today, so they still must be doing something right. They also made something called the Model 300. The Model 300 is a semi-automatic rifle uh, designed as a sporting and military arm that's used by police and military all over the world. A really nice, compact, simple rifle. Next up is SKB Firearms Company. Fair. They produced guns for the first time in the early 60s. They've been around since 1855 in various guises, uh, making guns. And they have, well, recently stopped making guns in Japan, about 10 years ago. But we'll get to that. The original lineup of guns was very simple, with a couple of competition guns and a field gun. They import, exported to America and Europe, and people loved them. And as with all other Japanese guns, people bought them and put their names upon them. As time went on, they used this money to invest in more CNC machinery to build bigger, better guns, not bigger, better guns, but better guns in more volume. And as such, kept expanding their reach. Nearly all of SKB's shotguns have been produced for export, and by the 1980s, they had produced over 1 million guns. That's, that's quite substantial. You'll find them with various names on Ithaca, BSA in this country, put them on, as well as other makers and other importers all seem to need to put their name on there. SKB guns because the SKB name didn't seem to hold its own. In the late 70s and early 80s they were struggling a little bit financially and actually were producing stocks and barrels and actions for Browning um, or Maruku 
uh, producing Auto 5 parts, a sort of double outsourcing, if you will. However, in 1983, they were actually bought out by someone else and they would put another load of money in to really try and boost that name again. And they did very, very well, producing a line of guns for themselves and a line of guns for Weatherby as well. However, that stopped in 2004 and business kind of petered out up until about 2008, 2009 recession when SKB Japan's factory closed down, which is very, very sad. Subsequently, they have been made in Turkey. Although they did apparently try for a few years to try and find somebody to make that same model action based off of the original SKBs, but they could not. So they now have a SKB original inspired design, which the purists will hate and the rest of us will go, yeah, that's all right. Maybe, I don't know, they don't produce them for the UK, so it's hard to tell. Original SKB models include, but are not, are not limited to the 500, the 600, the 605, the 100, the 200, the 8800, the 5800, the 885, and a Royal Deluxe side by side, um, which is just a very posh 200. Either way, some of these early SKBs are highly underrated guns. They are very well finished, very well engineered, and cost pence because nobody really fancies SKB's early guns, even though they are very fanciable. Some of their higher grade guns, in fact, are exceptional-ish, which is uh, quite a statement. <laughs> anyway, moving on, we're going to go to NRS Fuji. So the NRS Fuji Gun Manufacturing Company, or Nihon Roju. NRS Fuji is responsible for the Harters S27 over and under in the late 60s and early 70s. Although it is very likely this is just a back door Olin Nico kind of deal. Um, but it's hard to tell. They also made something called the Fuji Super Auto, which is quite smart. Anyway, they went bust and potentially, well, most definitely, were bought out in part by Howard because of that so Fuji Super Auto became the Smith & Wesson 1000, which was a Hauer made gun. So there you go, a company that kind of came and went. The chances of them making their guns in entirety by themselves is small. Looking at some of their designs and copies, it would have been much more logical they were just a finishing house or bought stuff out the back door. But again, none of this is provable or knowable and there's no information out there on it. So take what you will from that. The last little manufacturer I'm gonna talk about is KTG Kogyo. They made a semi-automatic shotgun called the A1100, which was sold in the UK at least as the Parker Hale 900. A fairly simple, very fairly smart gun that apparently was put as lots of other brands as well in America. There you go, that's all I'm gonna say about it. Just another gun company that sort of came and went. It's also referred to as KTG Industries because Kogyo just means industry. Now we're going to talk about a couple of military arms just to finish off because that seems to be the recurring theme throughout this series. And that is Minabea Mitsumi, which make the PM9, which is this little submachine gun thing used by Japanese paratroopers. The other military maker is Sumitomo Heavy Industries that make the Type 62 GPMG and 762 and make the Type 249 Minimi. My interesting fact of the day is this. Minimi stands for Mini Mitrailleuse, which means mini machine gun in French. So that was it, the short and confusing post-World War II history of Japanese gun makers. Guys, I hope you've enjoyed this video, I hope you've learned something, and if you have any facts that you'd like to add, please add them below. We're always willing to learn on this very confusing subject. Finally, as I said already, don't forget to like, subscribe, and potentially go and become a member, because supporting this channel allows us to make videos like this. And also gives you a direct advice email so you can directly contact us and have great conversations. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Take care, goodbye, and we'll see you next time.